Hi, folks. Uh, thanks to be here for this talk about zero runtime deployments. Um, I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been nicely introduced, so thanks a lot. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Uh, Hazelcast has two products. The first one is an in memory data grid, and you can think about an in memory data grid as distributed data structures. So you have a cluster, multiple nodes, you can short your data, you can replicate your data. The other one is called Jets, and I will use it heavily in the demo, so I, I won't go further right now. Zero downtime. So why zero downtime? Well, there are a couple of good reasons to want zero downtime. The first is that imagine you are an e-commerce shop and you want to sell at all costs at all time. Zero downtime has a direct impact on your revenue because when you are down, well, nobody comes to buy your wear. So business is very keen on wanting zero downtime. Imagine you are not an e-commerce shop, but when actually you have zero downtime, people cannot access your site and they would probably go to your competitor's site, which is not good either. So you have either a direct or indirect effect on your site. And the idea of downtime is basically very <laughs> like related to IT people. Like I started working when it was a time where you wanted to deploy your new application, you just add uh, a static page on your uh, public facing site. Meanwhile, you were deploying and you told your user, hey, please come, please come back in 20 minutes or 40 minutes or one hour. And of course, it, it was never managed. So it was a way, hey, come back later. And then we deployed finally and we removed the static page. But users nowadays, especially users that are not in IT, they don't understand this kind of stuff because when they go to Google, when they go to Amazon, when they go to Facebook, when they, they go to any like big site, they never have seen such a, hey, please come back later sign. They just expect your application to be always up. And for this reason, you should probably think about doing zero downtime. There is a third reason which might not be that good, but well, we are engineers. Uh, we like um, to have a nice career, and we like to put stuff on your uh, on our resume. And so, in that case, you might want to do zero downtime to say, "Hey, we managed to do that." And for your next step in your career, you say, "Hey, I managed to set up zero downtime in my previous company." If we talk about zero downtime, the oldest trick in the book is blue-green deployment. Blue-green deployment is actually very, very easy. You have the production environment, and by definition, it's the blue one. And your users, they are directed to this blue environment. It's a web server, a, like an application server and a database. And meanwhile, you deploy your new version of the application on another environment that's completely mirrors the blue environment, and by definition, it's a green one. And when you are ready, when you have uh, finished setting up everything, then you just say, hey, let's move our users to the new environment, and everything is fine. Everything is fine might not be that so good, because as you can see, there are two different databases. And so if we, if we have millions of records, that means that we, we have to migrate like those millions of records from the blue database to the green database. So there is a variant that they, hey, let's use a shared database. And that's what I used to tell before, and we will see how it goes. And the problem is exactly the following, is all the problems we have when we do blue-green deployments or any kind of deployments is state. And we would like our workloads to be completely stateless, but unfortunately, they are not. Our users, they carry state with them. And they are like in like the most basic example of states, like state is in the database and state is in memory on the nodes because we have user sessions. We would like to pretend there is no user session, but in general, we have user sessions. So comes Kubernetes. And as you know, Kubernetes will solve all your problems. 
And Kubernetes comes with the idea that you have these rolling updates. So you deploy nodes, nodes um, of version 1.0. And then when you already say, hey, let's do rolling upgrades. And now your nodes, they upgrade in a rolling fashion. And it's perfectly fine. But I'm not that sure. Actually, there are ways to solve problems related to states, um, but it's not relevant to Kubernetes. The first is, what about the sessions? Well, uh, sessions replication has been known since a long, long time, and it, for good reason, because even if you don't do ze um, a zero downtime deployments, you probably have a reverse proxy and in front of your like your multiple um, application servers, and even though you probably have session affinity, if one of the nodes fails, you probably want to move your session data to another node, like for Tomcat, for example. So session replication is pretty pretty widespread. I believe it's a solved problem. Uh, it's in the demo, but I, I won't go like deeper into that. You can check the code. But databases, really databases, it's, it's the, the real problem. As I mentioned before, um, I already tackled this issue and I said, hey, <clears throat> let's keep the same database. And <clears throat> in order to do that, that means that at some time, we will probably have to cope with schema changes. And now imagine the following. We are still using Kubernetes. Now we have to model the database and we have, might have incompatible schema changes. Now we, did, we do the rolling upgrade. We start with the first node. We upgrade the node. Now we upgrade the database node. And of course, if we upgrade the database node, the old version 1.0 cannot cope with the new version 2.0. It doesn't work. Okay, that's not an issue. We will do something smarter. We will do the following. We will just do the rolling upgrades of all nodes, all application nodes, or pods in that case of Kubernetes, and only at the end do we upgrade the database pods. And that seems to be working. But if you are not people, then probably you say, hey, but how do we roll back now? Like, if I want to roll back, it doesn't work anymore. And I'm really, really sorry. Um, I know most of you are probably developers. I'm a developer as well. Um, but when we deploy something, there is a non null probability that something fails and we need to roll back. And not having the option to roll back is just not feasible, it's not acceptable. So let's be concrete and use the e-commerce use case. I've been working in e-commerce. I like this um, context because everybody can understand it. Um, and here you can see that I have three tables. I have a customer table, I have a product table, and I have a cart line table between a customer and a product. So a customer has many um, one-to-many cart lines and the cart line has a one-to-one -one relationship with product. It works pretty well, but then business comes in and they say, hey, we have a new requirement because business loves to have new requirements. And they say, hey, look, we have a lot of abandoned carts. And so what we want to do is we want to keep track when the uh, cart was last updated and if the person doesn't purchase in the end, we want to like store this information. And after one day, one week, whatever, we want to send an email saying, hey, dear customer, perhaps you forgot your card. Here is a nice discount, please buy. That's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good argument that can be heard. So, now you go back to your, uh, to your chair and you start designing a new model. And the new model is the following. Between the customer and the cart line, you introduce this cart table. And this cart table has a last modified column. So it's the same schema, but basically you introduce a new table just for these requirements. 
makes sense. And now we must handle the fact that we need to deploy using the same schema and possibly roll back. And because it's a non-compatible change, we need to plan ahead. And we need to split this huge change into a series of changes that are compatible side by side. And the steps are the following. The first step, we will create the court table. The application will still use the customer and court lines table and will be completely oblivious to the court table. Now there will be a mechanism. It can be in the codes, it can be in the database, can anywhere that every time you add a new court line, if it's the first court line, you will create the court record. And when you add new court lines, you just like update the last modified uh, attribute. Now, if we need to roll back at this point, that's fine. We just added additional data in the court, but the rest of the application works as expected. So if we need to roll back, that's fine. We just have an additional table that we don't use, and that's perfect. The second step will be actually to move the source of truth from the like customer court line to the court court line model. But we still want to mirror the changes. So every time you do a change to the table, to the, um, sorry, to the court line, we need to update it with the customer ID still, which is fine. Now, we, if we need to roll back, since again, every piece of the data will have been mirrored, that's still fine. We still have everything in the um, customer and court line table. The third step is the hardest one, in my opinion. You will need to migrate data. But why? We did everything we could not to migrate data. Yes, but imagine that during this process, there are people who, are, who had a core but didn't touch it. That means that somehow you need a badge, you need something to parse all of those untouched cards and migrate them to the new schema. And finally, there is the cleanup. So we can see that this approach has several downsides. The first one is every time you do a change, you will need to think whether it's breaking or not breaking, and probably it will be breaking, and you will need to split it into a succession of small steps. Second problem, you cannot roll back two steps. When you start a, migra a migration, you need to finish it properly. You can roll back one baby step, you cannot roll back two baby steps. You are already too far into the process. Because of this, because everybody is involved, it needs a lot of planning and not only in one team, in every team. Like the developers need to care about it, the ops need to care about it, the DBAs need to care about it. And as I mentioned, the idea was don't migrate the data, use a single database, but still you will need to migrate the data anyway. Granted, it will be in the same schema, in the tenant table, but you will need to migrate data anyway. And again, if we have a lot of records, that's not great. So the option two that uh, I know consider is that since we will be migrating data, well, embrace it. And we, we can have two different databases. Then we can have any breaking change that we want. We don't care. But the migration is not implemented by batching, but by change data capture. And I will go uh, describe it just afterwards in data streaming. Then the developers, they are not impacted. They can do whatever they want. Then it will be the ops job to deploy the streaming job. I will talk about it later. And the good thing, it can work with any deployment options that you might want. For example, canary release. Instead of being blue-green, you would just deploy like 
a little bit of your uh, user to this new schema, check if it works, if it doesn't, and whatever. Change data capture. So the idea of change data capture is it's the, it's the reverse, it's the opposite of even sourcing. The idea of even sourcing is that you will not store the state, you will store events in your data store. And when you need to access the state, you will replay the events in order. And because uh, the number of events might be very, very big, at regular interval, you will take some snapshots so you don't need to go back from the beginning of the birth of the universe. Now, we've changed that I kept you, you ju just do the exact opposite. You keep the state and out of the state, you create events. You might or already have done some change that I kept you in the past without knowing the world. Uh, if you have, for example, a table and you have a dedicated column for uh, with a timestamp, with a status, with whatever, and at a regular interval, you pull and you check and you change the status at the same time, it's changed data capture. So imagine now that we want to do what I proposed here on Kubernetes. This is my starting point. I have three pods, V1, that use a single blue V1 database pod. I will use like a simple database pod, a single database pod, because it's a SQL database, the, it's the easiest port. The second step is I will set up the green database with the new schema, with whatever I need, with the data I need, reference tables, stuff that actually is not changed by the application. And I can take all the time in the world I need to do that. The third step is where the magic happens. I will have something that actually like listens to changes in the blue database, transform the data according to this green new database and put the data in the green database. So every time this application pod does something, it will be replicated here. The next step, we will start doing our rolling upgrades. So now we have these V2 pods that uses the green database. But actually, since previously, all the changes were migrated from the blue to the green using this forward pipeline, then this pod has all necessary information. At some point, all the pods will have been rolled to the new version, and there, will, there won't be any more data changes from the blue database that needs to be streamed to the green database. It's the time where you can switch off job, and you can keep the blue database, perhaps for auditing purposes, especially the first few times you might be afraid to lose data, so let's keep it and store it. and. And then you can do it again and again and again. So how do we like implement this forward pipeline? Well, as I mentioned on the session replication side, we can use Hazel cost via Spring Session or anything, but we have Spring Session. My demo is about it, it, it uses Spring. And for the, the pipeline job, we have something called Debezium. And by default, like initially, the Bezium was designed to string changes from database to a Kafka cluster, but actually it's a library. We can leverage it and just hijack the talk with uh, Kafka by doing our stuff. I mentioned IMDG and now we have Jet. So the idea is that HazelCalsDev is an in-memory stream processing engine distributed by default. You can read from different sources, do the transformation, and write into different targets. Something that might be interesting to you is that, um, in general, you might want to 
like you just get events and if you need to do additional enrichments it's not necessary to go to the database every time because it will be much much slower but you can what you can do is you can preload all your database reference table into the, the imdg and then it will be only in memory or through the network there will be no describe it will be very very fast so this is the final architecture here i have a jet cluster and I have my two databases here. For example, I'm using MySQL, but you can also use what I'm showing you by uh, like for doing data migration from MySQL to Postgres or whatever. And here I have my custom job. I will be using the JET API and inside JET will be leveraging Debezium. Debezium itself will be leveraging its connector to any one of the supported databases. Right now, there is Postgres, there is MySQL, there is Microsoft SQL Server, there is, I believe, Cassandra, and there are a couple incubating, including Oracle. And I've talked a lot, and now it's time for the demo. So, of course, I did some changes this morning. I actually merged PRs from the Pandabot. And so just to manage your expectations, it was not super great. It worked, but not as good as before. So let's see if the Debo gods are, are with me now. The first thing I want to, to, to do is to deploy the initial state. So I will be deploying the blue database, uh, k-apply f infrastructure. Hey, that's not fun. Hmm? OK, I will have to, have to type everything. Blue, white, yellow. And now I will just get pods watch. And it's running. So now I will be doing K logs blue. I don't have the auto completion. It's not great. So what I will be doing, I will be using this, which has auto completion. And I just need to make it a bit bigger, otherwise it won't be fun for you to read small stuff, especially if you are old like me. Uh, now I will be logs blue dash f. Yes, it has started. That's great. So now what I want to do is I want to deploy the application. K apply f infrastructure should application dot yaml. They get pods W to watch the pods being created. So now they are being scheduled by Kubernetes. It's a Java application, so it takes a bit of time for it to start up. And of course, we don't want to stop too fast because otherwise Kubernetes will say, hey, now I will send you request. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Hey, let's keep the pods. And it will do that all the time. So we don't want to do that. We just and uh, better have some like, hey, one of them is running, two of them, three of them are running, amazing. So now here I am in my uh, e-commerce shop. The first thing that I need to do, I need to use uh, a user. And here I didn't want to have Spring Security or whatever. It's just like very quick and dirty. So here I, I'm logged in. I'm logged in as Joe and I can put stuff in my cart as Joe. Now I can have another user, let's say Jack, and Jack puts two t-shirts. And then I can have William, and that's three hoodies, and Avril, and four stickers. So it will be easy to remember at the end of the, the, the migration here, uh, like uh, Jack should have uh, two t-shirts, William three hoodies, and Avril four stickers. Now let's get back to Joe. And here we can, I mean, we can add anything. So the second step is we should prepare the green database. So uh, let's do that. Uh, K, uh, yeah, K is alias for kubectl because I'm super lazy and I, I don't want to write kubectl every time. Um, that's something that I don't mention, but yeah. uh, green.yaml. K okay, get pods W. Just check that it works. Yes. Let's see that. Uh, 
let's just wait until it has started. It can take any time. Meanwhile, our application is still working. We can still put stuff on our uh, cards. Perfect. So the next step is to actually deploy this pipeline. So k apply dot f infrastructure cube. And it's called forward because I will be going forward. And I can show you the code a bit because I think that's interesting. And you, you, you will see it's not that impressive. Um, here I have like four classes, amazing. And the main class is actually a real main class. It's not a framework, nothing. It's just a regular main application. In that case, I'm having the job and I'm, in, I'm not having like a dedicated JET cluster. I will start everything. I will start the JET node inside my application. That's probably not what you want to do in production. In production, you want to have dedicated JET cluster where you send jobs. But here for demo purposes, it's just like easier to do that. And what I'm doing is I will create this JET instance and then I will submit this job. And this job, comes from this pipeline and this pipeline is like, actually is, it reads like English. Read from the blue environment, add timestamps. Here I will add timestamps, not necessary. Map every change record. The change record is what the JET API gives me to the value. So I have a header and I have the value, I just want the value. And then like change this record, like map this record port to a map. And then map this hash map to what I call call parameters and write to the green environment. So at the end, and IntelliJ tells it, you have a stream stage of call, parameter, call parameters. How do we write to the green environment? Well, again, it's a lot of configuration. Here is just configuration. Here we create a context and basically is just to like get the pool, the um, database connection pool. And what we, we are doing is insert cart line. Inserting cart line is what is just calling a creeper statement. So it's just like call insert cart line, nothing mind blowing. And reading from the blue environment is just what? It's just configuration that's ready for you. We already have made, made this accessible through like a very high level API, what you just need to set is the database address, the port, the user, the cluster, everything. But I, I didn't write any real code here. That actually is just a DSL. So by now it should have uh, been uh, created, k logs forward dash f. Yes. And you can see that actually it has started, it has already like calls the insert cut line multiple times. So for every row there was, uh, it, it has called the um, prepare statement. So it, it has read from the blue environment and called the stored procedure on the green environment with customer ID one, with product ID one, quantity four, two, 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 three, three, three. So since those change happened before, we could have thought, hey, but they are, they, they are not taken into account by uh, the streaming pipeline. Well, they are. And now every time we do a change, so we, we interact with the database, now my like customer ID one as uh, with product one as quantity five, yes, it, it's actually like in sync. So every time we do a change here, we can see the same change happening here. So that's what we are doing. We are actually streaming the changes from the blue database to the green database. The next step is finally to do this rolling upgrades. So how do we do that? Well, I will just apply the new version of the application. So I will be inserting this new table. It has been inserted in the green database, but now, the version two will use it. And uh, it's called application two.yaml. Okay, get pod w. And now we can continue playing with the application. And just to show you that it's really, really zero downtime. So I will regularly add stuff to the code. 
not too quick because otherwise I think that my front-end skills are not that good. Uh, so uh, this is actually, um, um, sorry, how it's called, um, uh, X, uh, XML HTTP request. It's an async request. Uh, so sometimes it's the, the um, sorry, the callback, I didn't perhaps put it very well. No. So yeah, it's super boring. So let's, let's check that um, it's still working. No, I, I missed one here. That was the one. So let's refresh everything. And that's what I told you, the, the demo gods are not with me today because now we can see that, hey, there is a slight problem. It is blocked. So um, the reason for that is not yet known. It's probably because I upgraded something that I shouldn't have upgraded. And normally uh, when my application gives me the go again, so it's not as seamless as in the past, but normally I shouldn't have uh, lost any data and it would be good because now I'm doing in front of people. Ah. I don't know why this happens. That's unfortunate. Yes, that's what's probably the problem was. <laughs> there is something not nice. So let's try to refresh it again. Yes, but that's not really as seamless as I wanted. And, and we can still continue to add stuff to our cards. So probably I need to check like uh, in the details what happens. But the good thing is, well, here I could still interact with the application an application that was used as, as Joe's card is still there in the new version of the pod. So here we have version 2.0. And uh, with Jack, we can still see uh, he has two items. William has three items and Errol has four items. We can check that actually the four items are stickers. OK. I believe that's it. Not as good as expected, but not too bad. So takeaways for this talk. Um, zero downtime is within your reach. In my previous talk, uh, where I advised to use the same database, I told people, hey, not great. I probably you should really, really consider um, the, the, the impacts to your organization, to your velocity, because it, it will slow you down. With this new approach, actually, it's pretty like completely straightforward. You can, your, the, the concerns from your developers and the concern from the ops people are completely decoupled. So your developers can change the schema, do whatever they want, and then they will create this pipeline to read from the old schema and put it in the new schema. And then it will be the, uh, up to the ops to deploy, but as you can see, it's pretty straightforward as well. You deploy, the green schema, and then you deploy the pipeline, and yeah. And in order to do that, you need to handle the states, and the state is in two places. Then for session, you have session replication, and for database, you have change data capture and data streaming. So I thank you a lot for your attention. You can read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I believe that um, I was very, very quick on the code, but um, if you want to check it by yourself at home, they're all the time in the world, it's on GitHub, it's freely accessible. Um, if you find the, the, the problems that I had in this uh, migration, I will be happy that you send me a pull request. And if I got you interested in hassle costs, you can join our Slack. It's always nice to have newcomers. Or if you are perhaps too shy, you can first get some free training before. So thanks a lot. And I believe uh, now there will be some time for Q&A.